Well, hello, boys and girls, and welcome back to Library Class at Home with Mr. S. This week, we have been reading The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary, and a lot of stuff has happened this week. Uh, Ralph was almost sucked up by a vacuum. He had a family reunion. He lost the motorcycle. Keith decided that he's not really angry with him, and now they're in a bit of a predicament because management knows that there's a lot of mice there, and they're afraid that they may call an exterminator. So when we left off in chapter 9, Ralph was like, I know exactly what to do. So the name of chapter 10 is An Anxious Night. That's the title. The title of chapter 10 is An Anxious Night. So do you know what it means to be anxious? That means to be worried about something. So worried that you can't sleep or you can't eat. So we're going to find out why it is an anxious night for Ralph and his family. So here we go, chapter 10. At first, Ralph's scheme worked. Keith delivered the promised bacon, toast, and jelly. The mice ate sparingly and laid aside the leftovers against the day that Keith must leave the hotel. Ralph's mother continued to worry about tipping room service. I want to do the right thing, she insisted. There must be some way we can manage a tip. The mice dared not leave the nest to search for small coins that might have rolled under beds and dressers. It was late in the afternoon when Ralph heard Keith and his parents returning to their rooms. Very quietly, so that his toenails did not make scrabbling sounds in the woodworks, he slipped to the knothole and peeped out in time to see Keith flop down on the bed. Do I have to go down to the dining room for dinner? Keith asked his mother and father. I'm not even hungry. Uh-oh, thought Ralph. There goes dinner. I told you not to eat that whole bag of peanuts so close to dinner time, said his father. I didn't eat all of it, said Keith. That's good, thought Ralph. At least there would be peanuts for dinner. You'll feel better after you get washed up for dinner, said Mrs. Gridley. Hurry along now. When his parents had gone into room 216, Ralph noticed that Keith seemed to drag himself off the bed. He walked to the wash basin, turned on the cold water, moistened his finger, and wiped them over his face. Then he turned off the water and gave the middle of his face a swipe with a towel, which he returned to the towel rack in such a way that it immediately fell to the floor. Keith did not pick it up. But there was nothing unusual about this. Boys rarely picked up towels. What was unusual was that Keith returned to the bed where he sat down and stared at the wall. He did not play with his cars, nor did he eat the rest of his peanuts. He just sat there. Ralph stuck his head out of the knot hole. Hey, is anything wrong, he said. Oh, hi, said Keith very sadly. I feel kind of awful. Say, that's too bad. Ralph ventured a little further out of the knot hole. I know what you mean. Thinking about the motorcycle makes me feel awful, too. It's not that kind of awful, said Keith. I feel awful in a different way, sort of like my insides. Think you'll make it to dinner, said Ralph? Oh, I guess so. There was no enthusiasm in Keith's voice. Is there anything I can bring you? Oh, whatever. Whatever's handy, said Ralph, who hesitated to place an order when he could see that Keith did not feel like going to dinner at all. Well, we are sort of, um, depending on you. The housekeeper found all those sheets I had to chew through to get out of the hamper, and I understand she got pretty excited about mice. We're laying low until the whole thing blows over. A smile flickered over Keith's face. Don't worry, I won't let you down. I saved you some peanuts. I thought they might be handy for storing. Gee, thanks, said Ralph. Keith got slowly off the bed and poked the peanuts one by one through the knot hole. When he had finished, Ralph popped out again and said, Thanks a lot. Keith smiled feebly and flopped down on the bed once more. Ralph went to work, moving the peanuts away from the knot hole to make room for whatever dinner Keith brought. He felt it would be fun to be surprised by the menu this time. It was something of a shock to find dinner which was stuffed through the knot hole much earlier than Ralph expected. It consisted of a couple of broken crackers. Ralph poked his head out to see if any more were coming, but Keith was already getting into his pajamas. Aren't you going to bed a little early, said Keith, realizing he had not even heard Keith's parents come in. Oh, I felt so awful I couldn't eat, so they told me I'd better come up and go to bed. Keith tossed his shirt on the floor of the bed and pulled on his pajama top. 
When his head emerged, he said, I'm sorry about your dinner. It was the best I could do. All I had was a little soup. Oh, that's all right. All right. Ralph was beginning to be concerned. If the boy could not eat, neither could the mice. Keith fell into bed, and Ralph ran off to report the news to his relatives. Oh, what a shame, said Ralph's mother. That poor boy. Oh, dear, whatever shall we do, said Aunt Dorothy. Our very lives depend on him. The little cousins huddled together, big-eyed and frightened. Yes, what about us, said Uncle Lester. How are we going to manage if he doesn't bring us our meals? It isn't safe for us to go out pilfering when the housekeeper has declared war on mice. I knew it was a mistake to depend on people, said Aunt Sissy. We'll manage somehow. We always have. Ralph's mother was trying to be brave, but Ralph could see how worried she was. After all, he did bring us a supply of peanuts. We should be grateful for that. He didn't bring many of those peanuts. Uncle Lester did not sound the least bit grateful. The greedy fellow is probably ill from stuffing himself with nuts he should have saved for us. Serves him right. Now, Lester, fussed Ralph's mother. The boy had a right to eat his own peanuts, but I do wish he hadn't been quite so hungry. Ralph returned to the knot hole. Keith was lying in his bed with his sports car in one hand. How do you feel now, said Ralph. Oh, I feel awful, said Keith. Before Ralph could reply, footsteps in the hall warned him that Keith's parents were coming. He drew back inside the knot hole where he could observe without being seen. Mrs. Gridley paused by her son's bed and laid her hand on his forehead. Hmm, he does feel a little warm, she remarked. He'll probably be all right in the morning, said Mr. Gridley. He just hiked too far in the sun this afternoon. Hmm, I hope so. The boy's mother sounded less certain. Mr. Gridley filled a glass at the wasp station and brought it to Keith. Here, son, drink this. When Keith had drunk the water, he fell back on the pillow and closed his eyes. His parents went quietly into room 216. When it was good and dark, Ralph ventured through the knot hole. He could hear Keith breathing deeply and knew that he was asleep. Since he had no one to talk to, he found his little crash helmet where he had hidden it behind the curtain, and after he had adjusted the rubber band under his chin, he climbed up to the windowsill to look out into the world beyond the hotel and to dream about the lost motorcycle. From his perch on the windowsill, Ralph saw that the parking lot held more cars than usual. This meant that the motels back on the highway were full and travelers had followed the sign pointing to the Mountain View Inn. He could hear the holiday weekend activity in the halls, too. People walking up and down, luggage being set with a thump on the floor, keys rattling in locks. Gradually, as the night wore on, the hotel grew silent. More silent than usual, for now even the second floor mice were quiet. There was no scurrying, no scrabbling or squeaking inside the walls. In the silence, Keith talked in his sleep and mumbled something that sounded like motorcycle. In a moment, his mother slipped through the doorway, pulling her robe on over her nightgown. Ralph hid behind the curtain, peeping out just enough to see what was going to happen. She laid her hand on her son's forehead and murmured, Oh, dear. Almost at once, she was joined by Keith's father, who was tying the belt to his bathrobe. What's the trouble, he said. Keith has a fever, said his mother. He's burning up. Ralph was shocked. The boy really was sick. It was not too many peanuts or too much hiking. The boy was really and truly sick. The father turned on the lamp on the bedside table, and he too laid his hand on the boar's forehead. Keith opened his eyes. I'm so hot, he mumbled. I need a drink. His mother pulled back a blanket while the father brought a glass of water and held up his son's head so he could drink part of it. Ralph watched anxiously, but this time he was not selfishly concerned about room service. He was concerned about his friend Keith, the boy who had saved him from a terrible fate in the wastebasket and who had trusted him with his motorcycle, the boy who had forgiven him when he had lost that motorcycle and had brought food not only to Ralph but his, so, his whole family. We had better get him an aspirin to bring down his temperature, said Mrs. Gridley. Mr. Gridley started towards room 216, stopped and snapped his fingers as if he had just remembered something. I took the last one back in Rock Springs, Wyoming, he said. I had a headache from driving toward the sun all afternoon. I meant to buy some more when we stopped, but I didn't think of it again until now. 
Oh, I should have thought of it myself, Mrs. Gridley said. I knew we were almost out. Never mind, I'll go get some. Mr. Gridley picked up the telephone, listened, shook it, and listened again. That's peculiar. The line seems to be dead. They must disconnect the switchboard at night, said the mother. But surely there is someone on duty at the desk downstairs. Every hotel has a night clerk. I'll go find out, said the father, and slipped out the door into the hall. I'm so hot, said Keith. I'm so hot. His mother wrung out a washcloth in cold water and laid it on her son's forehead. You'll feel better as soon as we get you an aspirin, she whispered. The minutes dragged by. What's keeping him, thought Ralph. Why doesn't he hurry? The old hotel snapped and creaked. Keith rolled and tossed, trying to find a cool spot on the pillow, and his mother wrung out the washcloth in more cold water. When is Dad coming, said Keith. His eyes bright and his cheeks flushed. In a minute, soothed his, soothed his mother. He'll be here in a minute. Oh, I wish he would hurry, thought Ralph. Still, the minutes dragged on. Finally, footsteps were heard in the hall, and Mr. Gridley returned to room 215. He's here with the aspirin, whispered Mrs. Gridley to Keith. At last, thought Ralph. I thought he would never come. Mr. Gridley shook his head. There isn't an aspirin to be found any place. He sounded thoroughly exasperated. First of all, the night clerk was sound asleep on the couch in the lobby. I had a dickens of a time waking him up, and when I finally managed to, he couldn't find aspirin anywhere. Oh, no, said his mother. Oh, no, Ralph thought. What about that little gift shop off the lobby, said Mrs. Gridley. It must sell aspirin. Locked up tight, and the clerk went home with the key, said Mr. Gridley. Oh, dear. The night clerk was really nice about it, said his father. He even came up and looked in the housekeeper's office. Well, how far is the nearest drugstore? Twenty-five miles back on the main highway, answered the father, and it closed at ten o'clock and doesn't open again until the morning. His mother held her watch under the lamp. It's almost one o'clock in the morning. It's hours until morning. She crossed the room to wring out the washcloth again. What will we do? What can we do, said his father helplessly. I even telephoned the doctor, but there's been a bad accident back on the highway and he can't come. The night clerk said he would telephone the milkman before he starts his route at six and ask him if he could bring some aspirin, but he won't be here until seven or later. All we can do is wait. Keith tossed and turned under the cold washcloth. Mom, I think I'd like to go to sleep now, he muttered thickly. I guess that's all you can do, said his mother, and she bent over to kiss his hot forehead before she turned out the light. Ralph did not even wait for the boy's parents to leave the room. As soon as the light was out, he leapt silently onto the carpet, and by the time they had gone through the doorway to room 216, he had hidden his little crash helmet behind the curtains and was halfway through the knothole. Somewhere, someplace in that hotel, there must be an aspirin tablet, and Ralph was going to find it. He only wished he had the motorcycle so he could find it even faster. Oof. Well, boys and girls, that was the end of chapter 10. What a predicament. Poor Keith is really sick, and there's no way to get him any medicine. But Ralph thinks he can find a way. What do you think, boys and girls? Do you think Ralph is going to find a way to get Keith some medicine? I certainly hope so. You can uh, leave me a comment um, below on my Google Classroom page and tell me what you think. Tell me if you think he's going to find the medicine in time. Don't forget to click the turned in button as soon as you've heard this story and check back tomorrow for chapter 11 in this exciting book, The Mouse and the Motorcycle. I hope you enjoyed hearing it. I know I've enjoyed reading it. Check back tomorrow and we'll see what happens. Thank you, boys and girls. See you guys later. Spaghetti. Come back, like when we decide to do them. Okay, I think this is good. By the way, you're rolling. What? Yep. No. Yes. I'm not ready yet. Too bad. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready.